warm welcome from the NAACP Mid-Manhattan branch. Join us as we celebrate Black History Month. Gracing us is legendary author, scholar, and keeper of the flame, Herb Boyd. Also, author and historian, Grant Harper Reed. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Kendall Reed, and I would like to welcome all of you to uh, the Mid Manhattan Branches Black History Month program. Uh, today we have two avid writers who will be discussing their books, and uh, I'm going to have Miss Michelle Sweeting introduce Mr. Boyd. Okay. All right. It's me. Uh, 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 I tell you, this is an honor to be in his presence. He is, as his bio says, an author, an educator, and a journalist. Now, you have your bio there, and I'm going to correct it, in that it says he was born in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, Basil. and that he grew up in Detroit, Michigan. But being born here in the village of Harlem, we know that this is where his heart is, where his passion is. He is a native son, as far as we are concerned, of the village of Harlem. Is that correct? Most oh, certainly. We love you here in Harlem. Now, it says also with regard to his bio, that is the Honorable Herb Boyd, that he worked as an instructor. That is in African American Studies and Anthropology. We know now, legislatively, we heard from Marvin Holland that there, the branch is going up to Albany. There is proposed legislation to make African American history mandatory Amen. in New York City yes. public schools. Yes. 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 Now the words in the program of anthropology, how easy that word rolls off my tongue. But most certainly he is a scholar in ethnomusicology, <laughs> which by itself is the study of music of different cultures. Those of us from the 70s and 80s know what it means to boogie and woogie well, can you imagine having a scholar who matches the words to the rhythmic historical origins of such words? We have such a legendary poet and scripter and author of such words in her voice. He was also, as we start to count words as a linguist, he took an aside as the supervisor of the office in operations at the U.S. Census Bureau. We as people of color, there are some who would say we're limited in our speech, limited in our words. Well, he ensured as the supervisor that we as people of color were certainly counted and not miscounted or left out. So we thank you for that achievement as well. He is a freelance journalist. He has written hundreds, if not thousands, of articles for some of my favorite reads that I continue to read on what day, Thursday, we know which paper comes out, the Amsterdam News, Essence Magazine, Emerge, Downbeat, First World, The Black Scholar, you name it, he has been a part of it. He has written over 25 books, and most certainly has received a number of awards, the most accomplished of which, the most excited of which I am excited about, is none other than this year's nominee for the NAACP Image Award. a test as someone who sits on the committee that has to review all of the submissions they come in from around the country of various authors for him to have transcended, cut through all of the authors to rise to the top. It is an extreme accomplishment that you have received the nomination for that award. So we commend you in the house of the NAACP. Now I see in the back that you have copies of your book. Now as a judge, I can't tell any 
anyone what to do and how learned they shall become. But I came with my own copy from my home and I said missing in all of its pages is none other than your personally scribed John Herb Hancock on my personal phone. I present to you all none other than the legendary keeper of the history, keeper of the flame, the one who, because he has written it in a book, a book that people of color, we are most certainly ordained and privileged to read. They say if you want to keep it a secret from African Americans, put it in a book. Well, he has defied it, that legend in that he has put a treasure of our history in a countless number of books. And again, to be in his presence, they say all rise in the court. I'm about to sit as you rise, and I thank you for all that you've done for us. We salute you. Let me say that I'm battling a cold. I started not to come, because you're never sure exactly if that flu shot worked. And you don't want to be out there, you know, spreading anything, but we decided this really, it was something else, it was an egg salad that hit me. Messed my system up. Where's the emodium? Yeah. <laughs> But I'm feeling a lot better now and certainly elevated completely yeah. to the top of the ceiling. To the top of the ceiling. That was just remarkable. Um, you know, we were talking about the schools earlier. And, and uh, Marvin, and it was good to be with you again. You know, I remember uh, when you came to the Amsterdam News, you were requesting our endorsement. And I just worked so hard for you because I was so impressed with your delivery and everything. You're a remarkable young man. Jeff, <laughs> Jeff and I have been uh, on the ramparts, you know, out there fighting. You know, I think he's like a, you know, a bona fide freedom fighter. You know, one who has started, I mean, the days that he spent with Charles Rangel alone has endeared him to our community. Yes. And, uh, you know, president, all right. <laughs> I know the other president too, uh, Derek Johnson. Mm -hmm. Derek and I, I met Derek doing the whole Katrina thing because yes. he was heading up the whole Mississippi branch of the NAACP. And I met him down in Gulfport in Biloxi at the time when I was down there looking at that whole situation. Two weeks ago, well maybe not that long, maybe 10 days ago, we had a situation here in our school system. 53 years ago, Malcolm X was taken from us. You know, ordinarily on the 21st of February, I find myself among a number of my com comrades and colleagues as we kind of, you know, reflect on the life of Malcolm X. So when Jeff said, we need you here, he got me first because right behind that came three requests to have me at the Schaumburg tonight. They have that thing at the Schaumburg, I think, uh, Lumumba and uh, Professor Ham and, and Ilyasa Shabazz is there, Malcolm Dorsey. I had a chance to work with Ilyasa on the diary of Malcolm X. You know, I figured I just, since this is that day when he was taken from us, here's my way of carrying a bit and pieces with me about him. Uh, this is probably the most important year of Malcolm's life in 1964. Mm -hmm. When he traveled all over the Middle East and North Africa and parts of Europe too. I mean, just a remarkable man who's literally flying, flying by the seat of his pants because, as you know, Kendall, he didn't have any kind of staff around him. 
you know, he had to pull together his own talking points, do his own research, and it's bad enough. You know, travel is rough. I mean, the stomach condition I'm uh, enduring right now is similar to what Malcolm endured. He thought he was food poisoning in Cairo. And, uh, as a matter of fact, when, when that happened to him, I was stationed in Germany, and I wanted to hook up with Malcolm because I heard he was traveling to North Africa, to Casablanca. And I took a 32-day pass and hitchhiked across Germany, France, and Spain, and into North Africa, into Tangiers, hoping to see Malcolm, and I missed him. Uh, I hung around there long enough to miss him. <laughs> and then I got out of the service, I got back to uh, Detroit in 1965, got a job at Dodge, Maine, and Malcolm was scheduled to come to speak at the Ford Auditorium. Those of you who know Malcolm's history, this house was firebombed. Mm -hmm. Valentine's Day, Hubert, February the 14th. He got all he could get out of that wreckage and shell was what he had on. Well, when we heard that, it happened about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. When we heard that, we said, Malcolm's not coming. He's lucky to be alive. But you don't know Malcolm. 9 o'clock that morning, he was on a plane. He arrived in Detroit. He spoke that evening at Ford Auditorium. And of course, I was working the graveyard shift, the midnight shift. I said, he's not coming. I went to work. My cousin attended the thing. He said, oh, you could smell the smoke on him. Because mm. all he had on was what he had rescued, salvaged, you know, from that firebombing of his home. So I miss Malcolm again. Mm. I've missed Malcolm in so many different ways, but connecting you know, in Black Detroit, I talk a lot about Malcolm in there. Because when Malcolm got out of the penitentiary, Jeff, he could have gone three places. He could have uh, gone back to Roxbury, back to Boston. That's where, of course, he had been arrested and imprisoned. He could have uh, come back to Harlem. And he had established quite a reputation in Harlem, obviously. Or he could go to Michigan, back to Michigan. And that's what he did because his family was there. And I think one of the things that Spike Lee missed in his film is the importance of Malcolm's family. Because it was, it was they who, who introduced him to the nation of Islam. Not no bimbo character that was in the film. It was his family, particularly Hilda, Wilford, and Reginald. These three siblings of his who brought him into the nation of Islam. I met Malcolm the first time in 1958. And whenever he came back to Detroit, I was right down front. There's always when John Coltrane would come to Detroit, I'd be right down front. And I'd stick my head right in the bell of his horn. <laughs> so I can't hear him pop. <laughs> but those two individuals are very important in my life in terms of my uh, political and cultural development. And Black Detroit is kind of a, a culmination. Uh, I was at an event the other day and someone said, Herb, how long did it take you to write this book? I said, 79 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. But I had one important writer with me, and she's 98. Well, she'll be 98 on May the 6th. And that's my mother. Oh, and she's in Detroit. <laughs> back and forth challenging each other in terms of how many different places we lived in Detroit. I think that's the only disagreement we had in terms of the sequence in a number of places. Other than that, she was just an indispensable resource for me in pulling that book together. So the book, Black Detroit, is a combination, you know, it was a memoir, it's an autobiography, it's a love letter to the city. I left Detroit in 1985 for Harlem. Um, it was my third time living in New York. I arrived in New York when I was 19 and I lived in the village and in Brooklyn. And I stayed around for a year and a half. And the army was chasing me. And I let them catch me. Because I was ready to travel. And I went off to Europe, uh, spent 18 months in Germany. And then when I came back, in 1978, I was oh, about six months in 78, and then I came back in 85. So I've been here 
Yeah, you're absolutely right, Michelle. I've been here since 1985. And I've got this divided thing. You know, my spirit is one place, but my soul is another. Mm -hmm. So I try to bring those things together. And I think that when I was doing a book, uh, uh, Kendall, uh, you was talking about Tracy Sherrard, who's my editor, and we battled because I wanted to bring a lot of the New York stuff in there to show the, the kind of similarities, the connections between historical events the kind of evolution and experience that went down in Detroit, very similar to what happened right here, particularly in Harlem. And she said, no, no, you saved that for your Harlem book. <laughs> Which will be coming one day, huh? Try to keep up with Grant, you know, in terms of talking about that Harlem history. And of course, I want uh, Grant to come on up and take over at this point because I'm getting ready to fall out. So Grant, come on up. The book well, is here. We'll talk up. to you afterwards on that, Michelle. Before he Thanks comes up, up Grant Hall. Come on. We have a, a special presentation. Thank you. NAACP, Mid Manhattan Branch, Black History Month, Founder Day, Founders Day Award is presented to Herb Boyd, American journalist, educator, author, and activist for a lifelong commitment in educating, advocating, and understanding the historical importance in telling black history from Detroit to the village of Harlem. February 21st, 2018, Jeffrey E. Eaton, President. Thank you. Give it up for this as well. I didn't get a chance to talk about a young man at Christ the King High School who wanted to put Malcolm X on his senior sweater. Oh, yes. But they denied him that. I mean, it, it's a controversial issue, but again, it brings Malcolm, you know, back, you know, in our presence. It's, not, it's everywhere, you know, it was a good teaching moment there. That young man was advanced over his principal and his teachers and all the other school officials, right? And trying to resurrect and reflect on someone he considered like an American icon. And they denied him that opportunity. So when they showed up at the National Action Network, I was right there with them. I'll be doing a television show with him on the 28th on um, Winston Gilchrist's show, The Gilchrist Experience, is on MNN. And you get a chance to see that young man, just absolutely. Goes on right after our station. You, you, you run it in. <laughs> <laughs> right after you, right? But that's important in terms of how Malcolm continues to live, you know, in our hearts and our spirit. You know, at the uh, situation since Black History Month, we're closing it down. And another young uh, teacher over at PS224. Yeah was trying to teach, you know, the African American history there, and yes. she was met all kinds of resistance. So what we're trying to say is that Black History Month it was all the way back to nineteen twenty six with Carter G. Woodson. And then it was Negro History Week. We talk about Black History Month, we're gonna push that a little bit more, won't we? Yes. Months and take it to a year. Take it to a lifetime. And I think that's what we need to do. It's more important Jim, than ever. You know, we have to struggle to keep that in the same way we have to struggle to keep the NAACP and the whole spirit of W.E.B. Du Bois and Roy Wilkins alive and well. Hey, Hazel Dukes, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get up for her, boy. Thank you. 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 Please support our black office. Please support our black office. As Michelle Sweet said to before, uh, the Honorable Michelle Sweet has said to you, she's on the Image Award Committee that reviews the books. Reviews the books and makes her recommendations and she made sure that book got in. And it was the reason why because there was a time that we could vote in the literacy section of the Image Awards. And that was taken away from us. So Michelle and I got mad about it. So at the convention, state, at the next convention, we built the Image Awards exhibit and say, what's up with that? Right? What's up with that? And they gave us all of us, we'll go back and check it out. We hit them again. We went, what, three, three, three years. We fought. And they said, all right, we're going to ask Michelle to be on the committee that reviews the books. Because we read. And, and if you don't allow voters, it's not just about voting for power 
Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. You know, your favorite actors and singers, and, and that's all good. But the most important category in the Image Awards is the literacy category. And we've had some amazing uh, members who have written books, like I'm Not an ATM. Mm -hmm. uh, it's written by Sabrina Lamb, a member of the Manhattan branch. And, and the fellow that wrote uh, 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 David Brown, um, Sam Brown, Sam Brown uh, and written by the Daily News author, who's a member of this branch. So it's important that we support our black authors and we get our people to read and their children to read. So I want to thank you again, her. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to have a little musical interlude. We're going to bring up our soldiers one more time. Rain, play Cuppy. Would you please like to sing something for us? Yes, well, because it is Black uh, History Month, what I do find is that we, many of us, our age, know about Negro spirituals. White folk do too. Matter of fact, they are using our music more than we do our own self. And I'm talking about spirituals. And there's just loads of them. And, and of course, everything I'm singing, I think all of us know it. I'm going to start off with plain old swing low sweet chips. Okay? Sweet blue, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Sweet blue, sweet chariot. Coming for the carry me home. I about his grandfather, who was a uh, theatrical producer, choreographer, choreographer, producer extraordinaire named Leonard Harper. Uh, the author grew up of, around many of the most famous entertainers in the world. He wasn't discovered until he discovered and researched his grandfather, Leonard Parker, a theatrical legacy that he was able to put all the pieces together Grant graduated from Bard College with a degree in the arts and studied at the National Academy of Arts and Science and in Ossie Davis New Cinema Arts Institute. Three very significant events propelled Grant before the fateful day when he discovered the family treasure chest to his grandfather's theatrical history. Grant, at 16 years old, 
photographed and became part of the inner circle of rock guitar great Jimi Hendrix. When, he, when the musical genius performed for the Harlem United Block Association, of which Reed was a photography student. In 1978, at the age of 25 years old, Grant cast and directed Michael Jackson by grabbing him by the collar and luring him out of his limousine. It was for a Motown Records produced documentary um, about the Commodores selling out Madison Square Garden for two nights in a row. Reed labored primarily in a thankless position as a freelance film locations department professional. He secured locations on major motion pictures, music videos, television shows, and commercials. He also told in promotional departments for Motown Records, Commodores, entertainment marketing, and various artists. By accident, one day, Grant stumbled upon a Harlem Renaissance. While exploring and exiting the local Harlem library, the book mentions his grandfather, and that changed his life forever. Reed dropped everything, spent decades, literally decades, prestigiously investigating his grandfather's life, talking to old timers, and undertaking such innumerable libraries and institutions which took him as far away as to the Theater Museum of London. So with Grant's first book, Rhythm for Sale, it's all about his grandfather, who actually was a choreographer, who started out when he was 12 or like 10 years old, and follows his life all the way up until the Cotton Club. Then Grant transitions from uh, Rhythm for Sale to the Harlem Bible, which Grant explores his life growing up in Harlem and all the uh, experiences that he's had during that period of time. So he has a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge. He knows all the little details, and I'm going to now present Grant Harper Reed. So he can, <laughs> so he can talk about his book and his experiences. Hello, everybody. I first want to say that um, it was a surprise for me to find out about my grandfather. And I did spend a lot of time in the Schomburg. And it was uh, because of Count Basie's, I want to sit down because I'm moving my balance. Count Basie's uh, rhythm guitarist, Freddie Green, used to give me stamps when I was a little kid. Uh, when Count Basie and him would come back from Europe, they would get like fans mailing them stuff. So he would give me stamps, he lived in my building. And my, uh, one of my cousins gave me stamps too. So I put those stamps together in a book. And then I, I, I worked for Spike Lee on Do the Right Thing. And he wrote about me in the Making the Do the Right Thing. So I said, let me go to the County Cullen and make a copy of the Making of Do the Right Thing. Where he mentions me and Robert De Niro on one page. As I was walking out, I saw a Harlem dictionary, and it was on the table of the librarian. I just said, let me see if they got my grandfather's name on inside. I saw a short paragraph, and the librarian told me, go around the corner to the Schomburg, and you'll find more information about your grandfather. So I found eight pages, and I found more and more and more in a lot of the books. Then I went, I was in the village with a senior citizen's house with some friends of mine. And I was sitting in the living room, and the way she was walking from the kitchen to the living room, she had so much rhythm that I had to ask her. I said, "Are you, are you, were you a performer?" And she said, "Yeah, I, uh, I, I was a dancer. I worked at the Apollo." And I said, "Well, I'm Lillian Harper's grandson." And she said to me, "You better go back to the Schomburg and all those other performing arts libraries and look in the newspapers, because back then historically, black people had a lot in those newspapers." Pittsburgh Courier, and they crossed, and Harlem was happening. They had a section of what was happening in Harlem, and I literally became dizzy. The security guards at the Schomburg used to have to turn the lights off and on for me to come out. I would be the last person there. But the, and, but the thing that got me was some of the books that I read about the Harlem Renaissance were written by outsiders and people that didn't have an empathy for our plight. 
And they wrote it as we were just happy singing and dancing Negroes trying to get tips. And so uh, it became my mission to write the truth and what really happened. You know, like when they talk about the, the Cotton Club, nobody mentions the pain that Lena Horn and Duke Ellington must have gone through because they couldn't use the toilet facilities. They had to go on Lenox Avenue, they were on their own. My grandfather, uh, he had, he, he produced, he opened up the Cotton Club, but he was mainly at Connie's Inn in Harlem. And that place was just as popping, but it didn't get as much uh, publicity historically. But there was a time all the white people would come down with the Duesenbergs and the Rolls Royces, and it was wonderful. And uh, Connie's Inn at first was black and tan, but they made it mainly white only. And except for a couple of nights, they might let some blacks in, but they would put them by the bathrooms or by the kitchen. But, and his chorus line was a mix in terms of the, uh, the way the, uh, the dancers looked, his chorus line. But because some of the white people felt uncomfortable, they asked him or ordered him to get rid of the darker skinned women, or you know, the darker skinned entertainers in his show. He was dark, he was, I call it seal skin and his wife. You must have heard him. But he had to do it. In back, because we're looking at back then and that, you know, to keep working, he had to do it. And it, uh, it was like that was part of what was going on in terms of the race. That's why you see a lot of pictures back then. Most of the chorus girls are very light skinned. Yes. You know. Now, my grandmother lived a couple of blocks away. She didn't want me to know any of my family history because he didn't marry her. He had a wife two blocks away, and he was my mother's father. And my when my mother was born, she was intimidated by my grandmother in terms of her roots. So, but I was determined to find out about all this information. And it turns out that, uh, like Sammy Davis's uh, mother was my grandmother's friend. All the Cotton Club ladies were my grandmother's friend. I eventually wound up working for uh, the Cotton Club movie with Francis Coppola. And we were out in Queens, and one day, they had the, uh, the kind club ladies sitting in director's chairs to make them feel good, you know, make them feel important. And they wanted to meet like Richard Gere and the celebrities. And one of the technical people brought me over and he said, uh, we have Grant Reed, would you like to meet him? And the kind club ladies, no, we don't want to meet him. We already know him. <laughs> so I said, I said to my grandma, I said, why are these ladies so foul to me? She said, that's because when you were in Atlantic City, you used to kick sand in your face. <laughs> so um, the book, <laughs> this book starts off with the beginning of my great grandfather, who was a coon shouter. And I don't hold anything back historically, how they used to sing about, I wish I could take this blackness off my face. And when he died, my grandfather actually went into show business to support his mother and his brother. And he traveled around. And his biggest thing was plantation days, which went to England. And um, he went over there with George Gershwin. George Gershwin did a show that sandwiched his shows. And they didn't want Americans over there. They didn't want blacks taking their jobs either. Whites or, white or black, they didn't want Americans over there. So they booed George Gershwin and he came back. But, my, but what happened was the show that sandwiched my grandfather's show, there was uh, the wardrobe person, niece, was a dancer in the show and the Queen of England, the Queen of England came and brought all the royals and they were jazz fans and they all loved the show and it gave my grandfather the entree and the recognition because everybody read about it in Harlem so when he came back to Harlem smack dab in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance and then Duke Ellington moved in with him he, he also he misbehaving in hot chocolates with his show you know so I'm this book is setting the record straight not only racially but just who did what because after he died some of his friends there were even his pallbearers I found out the pallbearers at his funeral were trying to take credit for some of his work yeah. You know, and I would go to uh, different functions, and it was a lady sitting up there, and she said she did that, and she did this. And one of my grandmother's friends, because a lot of them were still alive at that point, that were dancers, they said, Grant, if she says she's married to this guy and that guy, why don't you ask her for the marriage certificate? <laughs> you know, because she was lying. So this, this book really, uh, also, he did, 
He and Oscar Michaud directed the first, co-directed the first All Black Talking, and that came out of 132nd Street and 7th Avenue. And they did it in Fort Lee, New Jersey. That's all in here, and I detail what went on between the making of that movie. And um, his life was like, his life reflected what was happening to him entertainment-wise. Eventually, when the nightclub life went down after 1929 and the economic uh, boom went away and the white people stopped coming to Harlem, he was working at, he helped, he went to Chicago, worked for the, the Al Capone organization. And Al Capone was uh, on the way to, with the taxes. He wasn't there, but all of his other mafia people were in charge. And they had, a, they had like, it was like the, the cotton club of the Midwest. He was called to come back because Frank Shipman bought the Apollo, and Frank Shipman owned most of the theaters that he worked at, the Lafayette Theater and the Lincoln Theater, and Frank wanted him to do the inaugural show for the Apollo Theater, which he did. But as, as his, his shows were review shows, so he had a little bit like a puppet, a, you know, maybe a black guy would put a towel around his head with a pen and say he was a, a mystic. You know, they had, so it was like a variety form of entertainment. But people's, Taste changed, and they wanted to see Duke Ellington as the headliner. They didn't want to see the filler acts. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather's works began to uh, wane, and he started working in small nightclubs. And when he mentions in Malcolm X, Malcolm X, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X is mentioned in this book because he worked uh, at Small Paradise when my grandfather uh, was just before he died, and he was a waiter at Small Paradise. My grandfather's review form of entertainment was still happening, but it was like more like for senior citizens, more a social club, people were arthritic, but it was the same shows, but that's where it went out of style, and as soon as it went out of style, he had a heart attack, and uh, he was rehearsing a show, and uh, so the research in this book, I was able to, with his help, to get um, 132nd Street, and 7th Avenue named after my grandfather, to Leonard Hoffman. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so I got the NAACP history makers to recognize my grandfather, and um, Charlie Rangel, through the help of Charlie Rangel, I got uh, the congressional record. And my grandmother was also, with her civil rights work, a history maker at the NAACP, and uh, she got, and uh, this is from, my, my grandfather did the first NAACP show, the first benefit in Harlem, and he'd been recognized by Julian Bond, who wrote me a letter about it, uh, and this is the poster of the first annual dance with the Mills Brothers, and uh, these are some pictures of it, but I have, uh, this is the street, Leonard Harper Way, when they did the young right. <laughs> And this is, this is uh, the, your president's father. Jeff Eaton's father. And, and my mother. And <laughs> the reason why, they went to junior high school together. Uh, now that segues into my Harlem Bible. Because I used the picture of my mother, I cut her out to use a picture of her before she married my father. And uh, the Harlem Bible is, after I did this and I got all these awards, I couldn't believe it. You know, I'd be on the radio and they'd interview me and I'd say, who are they, who are they talking about? <laughs> For real. So uh, I got my fingers, got like more strength, and uh, I decided to write the Harlem Bible about me growing up in Harlem and Teaneck, New Jersey. And I put, not just, it's not all fun and games. It's a, to me it's a fun, I wanted to make it a fun read as a book, and I think it is. I think both books are fun reads. But um, I, I put the pain, the hidden pain that some of the black people that I knew as a child in this. Like, uh, my grandfather's friends on my father's side and my grandmother's side on my mother's side, they had friends that were, would walk around, go to the Red, my grandmother was like the main barmaid at the Red Rooster back then, so I, I, I was hanging around with all of them. And, but there were a lot of people that dressed 
a lot of men that dressed real nice and had suitcases, and I would see them going to work as a, as a, as a child, and I thought, they were CEOs or presidents of major corporations until I got a summer job working with them. And I went down to the basement and had to put on the messenger jacket just with them. And that's when I, I realized that they weren't the CEOs, they were the messengers. So I, I put, I, I tell the truth about what has gone on historically, and it's like a it's like a liquid sword in a way. That, that's what they said last year when I spoke. I went back to PS 197 where I went, and uh, they said it was like a liquid sword. I, I wanted to encourage the kids because when I went to PS 197, I was bused to uh, PS 7 in the Bronx. And when I went up there, the kids were more educationally advanced, and nobody, the Board of Education didn't take that into account. So we were just like left out there. And then so the white kids started calling us niggas and making jokes about us. So uh, we, faked, we faked a lot of it, to be honest with you. And I had to make up for that faking. And then right after that, when I moved to New Jersey, I uh, helped integrate a sixth grade school there as well. And there was a lot of white resistance. They wrote about it uh, a couple years ago. They did a rehash of it. So I have about Jimi Hendrix in here. I also have my summer jobs. And some of my summer jobs were working with gangsters. And uh, at first I didn't know what they were doing. Because I was just getting, you know, they told me to sit in, in the room and look out the window all day. I was getting a <laughs> Eventually they told me what they were doing. I found out and, uh, you know, I started, I got a reputation for having a, for being quiet and doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> They told me. I, they told me once that uh, they told me once that I was going to be working with uh, some prostitutes and showing them movies on how to have safe sex. And I was so stupid. I believed it. I thought. I said, "Man, this is great. You know, it's a health uh, thing." <laughs> I went down there, and it was the uh, the boss's sister, and she was a madame. So they wanted me to show the dirty movies to the customers while the beds was being occupied and one of the girls would be, they had a hostess and a maid and I was just showing the movies to get the guys, you know, riled up. <laughs> and I, so I got so mad that I was lied to that I showed the same movie over and over again. And it was a movie of a lady in, uh, with a Nazi hat on and a whip in her underwear whipping a bunch of guys. So I kept showing that movie, and one of the girls told the madam about it. She says, he keeps showing the same movies. And the madam took the, the turkey bone and threatened to hit me with it. I tried to quit. Eventually, I quit working with her. And, um, but I had a lot of jobs, interesting jobs, doing that type of thing. Gil Scott Heron's in this book because uh, they did uh, they did a concert in New York, not him, but they did a rock concert, like a Woodstock, in New York, right across 125th Street, in Randall's Island, and it was called Woodstock with a Hangover. <laughs> I detail this too. I brought my father and my brother there with me. It was the biggest mistake in my life. <laughs> my father was chasing me around, telling me to go home because of all the marijuana smoke. And, but I also write about how I went up to uh, Newport. This was the the end of the whole rock age. I went up to Newport Jazz Festival. This was the end of the Newport Jazz Festival. Before George, George Bean, when George Bean got mad because um, Dionne Warwick came to sing what the world we what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And a lot of the hippies didn't want that. They just wanted to hear the electric guitars. And they booed her, they threw stuff on the stage. And I was staying at a lady's house. I didn't know who she was. She had everybody staying at her house. She said, what's six more people? Come on. She had big pots and stuff. And I noticed Gil Scott was in the backyard nodding out. And I put in the book, I put in the book, the stuff that was going on in this lady's house will not be televised. <laughs> And the Beatles are in here, uh, the Rolling Stones. I used to uh, study at John Lennon's house, and I was trying to do some. I was with my, my teacher, made the Rolling Stones movie, ladies and gentlemen, and he was working with John Lennon, so he was too lazy to come up to the school to Bard College, so he had us coming down there. And um, 
Is that here or in England? No, it was in New York. He had a place in the village where he had a lot of film equipment. They just sold it. And um, I write about how, like, I forgot that he had, I, I saw John on Park Avenue, and I was trying to get him to let me use his equipment. But I forgot that he had a, such a deep Liverpoolian accent. And I asked him five times what he was saying. And then I looked over at Yoko Ono, and she looked like she was going to hit me with the peace bag. So I just ran off. I said, I cannot, I, would, I couldn't live that down if I got beat up by Yoko Ono, a Beatles wife. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, Fanny Pennington is my grandmother, and um, she was the uh, main barmaid at the Red Rooster. Also, our cousin was uh, Ella Baker, the mother of the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. So she took a lot of that, and Herb did an article about my grandmother with her Civil Rights Movement. And, and she worked, she's on the cover of the book, Church Ladies Without Employee Power. And because they grew up together as children, she's in that, that big picture by uh, James Van Der Zee. She and her, her sister are in that picture as little kids. So it's like a long, she, and you know, she met Haley Selassie and Malcolm X and everybody, you know. Yeah, she was an activist, that's why I'm trying to get the, I'm in the process of trying to get the street named after her, which was approved by Community Board 10. Right, Leonard Hawker, which street is Leonard Hawker Hawker? Leonard Hawker, 132nd Street and 7th Avenue was Leonard Hawker Way. And then they had branch with a letter of support yeah. on behalf of that, along with Congressman Wrangler. Uh, Grant, Reed, and Kendall really go back to my family a very, very long time. My father and family were very, very close. Uh, one thing about the Red Rooster you hear stories about is that's where Adam Powell used to have his constituent meetings. And my dad and Adam were very, very close. And they hang out at the Red Rooster. And there'd be a line of people. So where was the Red Rooster at then? It was 138 Street and 7th Avenue. Oh, 138 Street and 7th Avenue. had to go, had to walk down the steps. Three steps down. Three steps down. And Jax was right next door to us. It was not as, it was not as big as Showman's now. It was not as big as Showman's Cafe. It's now not a large place. And, and but that's the original. You episode. know, all the businessmen and all the top politicians, everybody would go through. Charlie Randall wrote about coming into the jocks. jocks. My grandmother worked yeah. the jocks. He, Charlie yeah. said that my grandmother would let him know that the date that he brought from the last week was there. And he would have to say, don't come in with the new date. He put that in his book. And Fanny also. Oh my God. Who's that? Um, at the church, at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Oh my God. With Adam Payne Powell, Fanny's been part of that church for over like a hundred years. Yeah. So she from church, she would go over to the Red Rooster. And let me tell you something. One night, Years, many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, it was dark, 110th Street. I was coming from a, a, some type of club function to score my grandmother home. And somebody grabs my hand. And my first reaction is, push it away. Then I turn around and I see his hand. And he's telling me, Jeff. You're not holding your grandmother right. <laughs> That's an act of love right there. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Um, in our early part of our lives, a lot of the stars and, and some of the people you heard about, Sammy Davis and Honey Coles and those individuals like that, they adopted us as looking out for us. So that whole star quality wasn't a big deal for us. When you go to Showman's, you see Sammy Davis Jr. or Honey Cole and Honey Grady say, hey, you come over here and tell me what's going on in school with you. And, uh, and we had to get back to that. But there was a lot of that going on to that great time. And a lot of stuff that you're going to read in this book is going to be very, very interesting. My dad is writing a book now. He's not about to finish it. But there's a, there's a lot of stories now. A few I got in the back of my head. But, you know, back then, everything was legal because that was the way of life. If you were black and, and going up in Harlem or in an urban city, 
that was the way of life. A lot of, of the affordable housing that you see constructed, money came from the city. And it's very important, like what he said about his father writing his book, if you have memories, it's, please write a book about it, because if you don't, other people will de redefine us in a not so positive way, a not so truthful way. When I was doing the research in the Schomburg, a lot of it, they had uh, a lot of these uh, fellowship people down there, and they built <coughs> these little cubicles for them. They only went out to talk to real people, real Holomites, when it was time for them to eat. And they just went and ate, and the books reflected it when it came out. You could tell that they, I remember Jimmy Booker, who uh, we were talking about, Jimmy Booker did the forge for the Malcolm X book. His wife was so outraged at some of them books that was coming out of the Schomburg from the research that she did like a three things in the Amsterdam. Right, okay. Correcting it and writing about what really was happening. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's what I'm saying. We need to we need to read we need to capture and hold our definition. And it's not an act of defiance, but we, we need to do that because if we don't, they're gonna be saying the Harlem Renaissance was just happy singing and dancing Negro. And I just want to add something to that. You know, this uh, past weekend, the NAACP had their national um, um, meeting here. So all the uh, board directors were here from across the country. And one of the things that they were talking about was how we must start telling our own story and not having others tell it. And at the luncheon, there was a young lady who wrote a book, uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and she went back in history of how that evolved. And then Dr. Brown, Mr. Brown got up, oh, yeah, right. and he, which Mr. is Brown. a board member, and he went all the way back in history <laughs> to do some correction. Yeah, and saved it. And lifted, it, was, it was an amazing luncheon, you know, and all she, she was innocent. In fact, they didn't really know what her book was truly about because they said they, they had not read the book. Mm -hmm. But it was called Lift Every Voice and Sing. She wrote the book because her son came home, who goes to a diverse school, who came home and started learning the lyrics. And she was amazed that her son was being taught these lyrics at his school. And they were sitting around the dinner table, and the whole family's eyes kind of lifted, and they were like, kind of like amazed. So that prompted her to write this book and do research on the book, and um, which just came out on Monday, I believe, sep um, February 19th. And, uh, but it just segued into what the National Board was talking about at the meeting on Saturday when we were there, that we must write our own stories. We must tell the stories, otherwise someone will write the stories for us, and our stories aren't really being told the right way. So that just works right into and the Brown answered how Howard University was founded. I mean, he went back to 1820, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, we were hurt just spontaneously almost. Actually, you got to go to a national convention and yeah. hear these stories, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff out there that we don't know about, but people are storing it, you know, that happens. I just want to say one more thing about the Harlem Bible. I just put put it out, and they, I got one review so far, and the guy said that he's comparing it to a, a James Baldwin book. So, like I'm, I'm still saying, who's he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Grand Reed. Grand Reed. Okay, NAACP, Mid Manhattan Branch, Black History Month, Founders Day Award is presented to Grant Harper Reed, author, writer, historian, for Rhythm for Sale and his time and years of research of his grandfather, Leonard Harper, who is a colored theatrical producer, director, choreographer during the 1920s and 1930s Harlem Renaissance era. To the Harlem Bible, which rediscovers the history, soul, and spirit of Harlem through the eyes of the author. February 21st, 2018, Jeffrey E. Eaton, President. Thank you.
Give it up for Dan Lee and Ed Hurt. What's the last sale we got? $20. The other one is Rhythm for Sale is uh, $15. Rhythm for Sale is $15 and Harlem Bible is $20. Okay, and books are for sale in the back. For anyone who would like to purchase a book. So just want to close out. This falls out this activist. Everybody's very active in this. Are you all engaged? All right. So March 19th, we're going to Albany. Tuesday. We're going to Albany, March 19th. So make sure you get prepared your name. March 21st, we got to save Wally. March 21st, we got to save Wally. Make sure you talk to Deborah Harris. Make sure you talk to Deborah Harris. The fight is right here with us now. So he's been inspired. And I expect a lot out of you. I want to recognize Carol Brown. Carol, please stand up. Carol Opera. The person who composed it is celebrating the 45th anniversary. Let's celebrate our history, right? And support our Harlem Walkers, support our Black Walkers, support our Black newspapers. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. And, uh, and please, please spread the word. We got work to do. Uh, we have uh, applications for some of you jobs. Uh, anybody who has a child, how uh, are they going to be? High school 14 to 18. 14 to 18. Uh, the deadline is March 31st. Please see Alicia Fox there. What is it? I have some of you some jobs. Of you. Oh, okay. Some of you jobs. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, ok